Welcome to Mish Music Talk with Michelle Weir in powerful conversations with singers, players, vocal groups, and industry professionals from around the world. This podcast isn't just about the music, it's about life and who the artist really is on the inside. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Mish Music Talk podcast, episode number nine. This is the first episode where we're doing an audio-only format. Previously, we were using video, but that became kind of challenging. So we decided to change to audio, and today's guest is the improvisational vocal artist Rhiannon. And Rhiannon is a member of Bobby McFerrin's vocal ensemble Voice Estra. She's actually got a lot of different projects going on, and one of the more interesting ones I think, is called We Be Three with Joey Blake and David Worm. It's just three people, and they do all their concerts a cappella and fully improvised, which is very, very impressive to me. And really, that's what Rhiannon is all about, is improvisation. And she brings that to all that she does in life, in her teaching and in her solo performances and her ensemble performances, and uh, even her beautiful uh, farm and the things she grows on her farm in Hawaii, which you're going to hear about in just a few minutes. Don't forget to go to mishmusic.com, M-I-C-H-M-U-S-I-C.com, to take a look at show notes and links that relate to this podcast. Here we go. Rhiannon, it is so wonderful to have you here in my home drinking white tea from your farm in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's very good, by the way. I, mm. I highly recommend it, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> it's our first year of producing a harvest, and uh, I'm really happy. So CDs are not selling the way they used to, so I take tea on the road. <laughs> you should. It's a fantastic. Good idea. Same price. <laughs> Is there anything coming up after the tea? Are you going to be growing other? Yes, another? we're harvesting. We're just about to harvest our very large turmeric crop. Oh. Organic Hawaiian turmeric. So healthy. Yeah, it's really I'm good. Really into mm-hmm. health herbs and things. Yeah, it's good for all all manner of things. So I actually travel with uh, a kind of turmeric paste ah. that's with black pepper and honey and uh, ghee, very tasty. Mm. And so there are a lot of um, there. We're learning a lot about how to um, sell and how to add it add products together to ways that you can use tea besides just drinking it. Mm -hmm. So there we are on the farm. Okay, that's fantastic. I am so happy isn't the right word because it's more than that. Um, I feel very um, honored, certainly, and um, and joyful that you're here because this is the very first Mish Music Talk podcast. Yay. And so you're the first um, victim that will be speaking <laughs> with me today. And I think you're the perfect person. I, I, I really do. Because the idea of this podcast is um, to not talk about the weather and what I did, you know, yesterday and what group I'm playing with now too much, but really get inside what's happening in the music, why, what's, what's, encourages encouraging Mm -hmm. us driving us to Mm -hmm. do the music and um, even what our fears might be or our stumbling blocks or or whatever and and also talk about life because life connects with that Mm -hmm. obviously Mm -hmm. so I think you're the perfect person so I'm so glad you're here I'm really happy to be here. You know, you and I have known each other a long time, but we don't live in the same place. We see each other at conferences, but very rarely. And it's really important for for us to sit down and talk to each other. We're both teachers of the music, teachers of improvisation, and we have a lot in common that we may not even know about. I've every every time I've seen you, I've thought, I just want to sit down with her. That's funny. I I felt that same way. Uh That's why I'm so glad you're here. And I wish we had three days to just hang out and... Yeah, well, maybe we can work that out. Well, let's do that. I'm coming to Hawaii Mm -hmm. soon. And uh, we're going to spend some time. It would be really nice. Great. Um, I thought I'd share with folks... There may be still a few lingering people out there that don't know 
the breadth of everything about your background and what you've done. So I, I do want to just give people a context before we get into talking about the, the, the nitty gritty of things. So if I may, I'll share some um, of your biographical in, information and please correct me if you know I'm wrong about sure. anything. I know some years ago you were involved in a larger all women's group called Alive. Mm -hmm. And shortly after that you were in Sovo So which in the vocal group community was pretty popular, mm -hmm. you know? And that, that group lasted for quite a while, I There's think. There's still, they still exist. Only one of the original members is still in it, but they do, they do seasonal work, I would say. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's still there. But that, Sovo So grew out of Voice Sister. Okay. Uh, we, all of us met Bobby in the early 80s. He was living in San Francisco and he was, gigging in the local clubs with trios and and the word went around that this was a really interesting singer so i started to go and listen to him and i remember earl solano club he sang an acapella version of spain and i thought wow. oh my god <laughs> oh my god look what he's doing <clears throat> and then he made his first record and uh and and he was still gigging, and he started inviting a lot of singers on stage. So I started sitting in me, and Patty Cathgard, and um, a lot of the members of Voice Sister. So there was a community that formed. Bobby was really good about seeing himself as part of a, a community there. And then he wrote, Don't Worry, Be Happy, and we all thought, Well, happy trails. Yeah, Bye, guy. Right. See you later, Bobby. <clears throat> well, just so, and, and of course, thrilled because what he was doing was opening the door for vocal music in a brand new way. He was talking about the voice as an orchestra, really being able to sing the whole range of your voice and fill in all the rhythmic parts and the melodic parts, and he can even do harmonic parts. So, um, and then he came back and wanted to make a vocal orchestra because he, he really thinks orchestrally. Mm -hmm. So he came back and, and we auditioned and auditioned and auditioned and 12 of us made it in. And that group toured off and on for 20 years. Wow. Mm -hmm. We went really all over the world. Mm -hmm. and in the beginning we had repertoire, we were singing repertoire of his, so we were learning. But we, we sang once a week and I would call it master class. 12 of us and him. And they were, they were extended rehearsals, maybe they were four hours long. And we would we would do things like matching tone for the, a bass singer and a soprano singer to match tone, figure out how to blend. We talked a lot about vocal blend. We talked a lot about rhythm. We talked a lot about scales. We talked a lot about passing tone from one to the other so it would be really kind of invisible and how to get those bell tones would really mm. shift. And uh, it was it was profound. Mm. And still is Dude. profound. Yes. Yeah. So we did that for a year. We, we did once a week. He went off the road, mm -hmm. and we did that. And then we started traveling, and first we traveled with that repertoire, and then there was a shift. I, there's more detail about why, but it doesn't matter, except to say we stopped doing repertoire. Mm -hmm. And we went on stage, and we did what is now called circle songs. We would each <clears throat> section, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, we would each be given a part by him, and then we would... Um, sing it but then he would shift parts underneath so the thing didn't stop sometimes the whole concert would be one extended piece that was shifting everything about itself but not stopping uh, i know there was something in his mind about um like extended singing where you don't stop allows you to enter deeper and deeper and deeper into the core of the sound waves mm -hmm. And that was really important to him. He's a deeply spiritually guided person. And that was at the core. And also at the core was um, not an egoistic, your song, my song, but how do we make this music together? Mm -hmm. So there was a deep influence on me. Wow. What a, you know, it's just such an historic event that Bobby created uh, these groups. Um, yeah. And you were part of it from the very beginning. Yeah, yeah. And just, just for anybody that's listening that doesn't completely have a clear picture in their mind, they were talking, of course, about Bobby McFerrin. And this is Bobby's 
uh, group Voicestra that is still currently out performing. Which is like v- orchestra, only Voicestra, <laughs> right, which gives you the right. concept. Yeah, and uh, they do currently go on stage and there has been no rehearsal or no talk about what uh, the music's going to be and there's no notes Mm-mm. and you just go and do it and that is an, a pretty incredible thing. We do an extended sound check. Because uh, his beautiful sound guy, Danny, um, listens to each one of us, we sing s- separately, and then we do a blend, we create two or three pieces by ourselves, that Bobby comes, we work. So there is a there is a kind of rehearsal, but it has nothing to do with what's going on on stage, except that in any kind of music, but especially in improvisation, you got to get connected. It's not that you need to know what you're going to do, but you've got to feel each other and and let go of any kind of separation that might be there. But I want to say that I think all of this actually started with that band Alive. Mm-hmm. So we were a five-piece band and there was no leader. It's the women's movement. Mm-hmm. And we were jazzers. Mm-hmm. We really wanted to write our own music in a jazz format and we did some jazz things. But we taught each other how to improvise and we taught each other how to work without a leader. Mm-hmm. So that when I got to Bobby, I was very primed for that I mean, because that means more to me. You get further when you all go together. If it's one person, there's this competing thing that starts to happen. That's it's really the death of creative music. Mm-hmm. It's just awful. Mm-hmm. So um, thank you, Alive. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I, I want to share with you also some of my early experiences with Bobby, not working with him, but just knowing him Mm -hmm. in San Francisco, Mm -hmm. because I was young, it was before I left the San Francisco Bay Area, I still Uh lived there with my parents, or maybe I had rented an apartment by that time, but it was before I went off and lived other places in the world, and people started talking about this guy, Bobby McFerrin, in San Francisco. You know, this jazz singer, they called him Uh at the time, and they said, if you heard him, you gotta go up and hear him. So... I went up on a Tuesday night at the Union. I don't know if you remember uh-huh. that little sure. club. Or maybe it wasn't called the Union, but it was on Union Street. I'm not sure. It's in, the, in North Beach. Yeah. Uh-huh. And yeah. Um, it was, you know, hey, there was how many people there? There was uh, 20 people there maybe in this little, uh-huh. little, little room. And he was singing standards. And he sang, I will never forget him singing My Funny Valentine. <laughs> and he was not doing all the Bobby things that he does today. He sang the song, but uh-huh. my God, it was so, yeah. it just, it was kind of spiritual. You know, there was mm-hmm. something about it that he just had this gift mm-hmm. for uh, soulful communication, you mm-hmm. know. Um, and then I rem- I went up. I was brave enough to walk up. You know, he was he had not even recorded his first album yeah, then. Yeah. And I uh, went up to introduce myself and just said hello. And he came and he sat with us at the table. And then he was started. He was very peculiar. He would just make little sounds. Yes, at he the was table. peculiar. You know, he would just start making little sounds. And then I took a lesson or two with him at the time. And he was just an odd, interesting, but darling and yeah. brilliant guy. And still, he's really, he's really in the midst of discovering the tone, all the tonalities of his voice. Mm-hmm. So it was hard to have conversations with him because he was in there. Mm-hmm. He he would pretend he was listening to you, but that wasn't really what was going on. Yeah. Now you can actually have conversations and he remembers what you say and mm-hmm. he's he's in another world but there I don't think there was any other way he could have gotten to this to the that kind of grand opening that he got to was okay I'm gonna go on stage and improvise solo yeah the solo so singers were all in voices so that's where yeah. we met each other and when he needed to go back on the road and and it was not time for voices he we formed a group so that we could continue to work in these ways. And we were still doing repertoire with that group. So then what happened is Joey Blake and David Worm and I mm-hmm. started saying to each other, well, what if Bobby never comes back? What if we don't sing with him again? How can we now go on without a leader? How can we construct improvisation in which there is not a leader, but there is forward motion? How can we not just stay on one chord or one pattern, one motif the whole time. Mm -hmm. So we started to teach each other about forward motion and creating chord changes that because we we know this Western music, it's it's deeply in our ears. There's no reason not to be able to find chord changes if everybody cooperates and doesn't go 
in some strange direction. Providing and that, they're listening. Right? Yeah, big rule, providing. Rule number one, <clears throat> mm-hmm. sing less, listen more. Right? Listening and <clears throat> not involved in the ego of their idea, but actually thinking about, this is what the music wants to do now. And then if one of the partners goes somewhere, you have to agree to go there. You you can't fight about it. You can't, you got to go, and you got to go right away. Yeah. So a little like improvisational comedy, isn't it? What I've it heard is. about that is that when you're doing that, you never block someone's right. direction. That's if they right. start a direction, you go with the flow of mm-hmm. the river. You don't go against it. And it makes mm-hmm. totally good sense. Because what if somebody next to you does something and in your mind goes, what kind of weird idea is that? Instead, you go, oh, I'll just sing with that. And by my singing with it, I will enter it. And lots of times, by the time you do that, you have created enough uh, strength in the part that it no longer is odd. It becomes something musically worthy. I've seen it over and over and over again. And if you fight it, 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 you're just stuck. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we we learned that with each other. And I then I thought, well, can I do this with instruments? Can I do this with harmonic instruments? Mm -hmm. So it turns out, of course you can. You just have to have the same listening agreements. And so you can't also be passive. You've got to be pretty aggressive about going forward and taking risks. Mm -hmm. But I, I was saying to the students this weekend in L.A. that I used to think about improvisation like leaping off cliffs. But I, I really, I don't feel that anymore because it's dangerous. You, you leap off a cliff, you could die. Yeah. <laughs> and then you're afraid the whole time, and that's not the point. The point is not to be afraid. Mm-hmm. The point is to be in some place that feels uh, 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 alive and awake, but not terrified. That's not good singing. That's not going to happen. Well, I <clears throat> excuse me. I had the good fortune a couple of nights ago to go to um, a show that you did with Jay Clayton, mm-hmm. who I also adore and uh, find her so interesting in her approach to improvisation. But you did a set of your own with the wonderful Atmara Ruiz, the mm-hmm. piano player. Mm-hmm. And um, I noticed that you walked up and I, I know I know the first song and most of the songs of the set were a hundred percent improvisational. Mm-hmm. Nothing pre-discussed with mm-hmm. Otmoro, just let's just start. And so you started, or maybe even he started, I can't remember, but the two of you, mm-hmm. you know, created a whole, you know, hour, fifteen minute or whatever performance based on that. I think there was one, maybe two actual songs you did, but they were almost not recognizable, you know, in as their original form. For example, the, the Joni Mitchell song, mm-hmm. Both Sides Now, mm-hmm. which kind of brings me to tears just to think about Joni Mitchell at all because I love her so much. Do you? Me too. Oh, yeah. my gosh. And also, she's going through some yeah. challenges right now. But, um, <clears throat> you know, it was, you know, if you took the lyric away, you might not recognize it as, as that song yet. Let the other lyrics were there, and as we actually, you and I spoke about the other night, I heard the lyrics in a different way than I've ever heard them mm. before because of the way you presented the song and brought it into a different framework and a different light, and it was just lovely. Mm. Thank you. Uh, there's, there's an interesting ride that an improvising creative musician goes through whenever you approach a song. Because we all love songs. I love song form. I've written a lot of songs. I've learned tons of other people's songs. Why wouldn't we love the way that goes? But so I'm I'm approaching her song, and I would say that um, her second ver- her second recorded version of that, which is on an album called Both Sides Now, with the Vince Mendoza Orchestra and right. the jazz band in the inside of it where she started thinking about her music in an orchestral way rather than a folk way. And uh, listening to it, that that particular song, it's all about the strings. They're all, they're like kind of uh, rolling through these chords. So it doesn't, it's not staying in one place. It's like waves, uh, like clouds maybe. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so um, it's 
was very inspiring to me. Mm-hmm. So that was where I took my clue you that she she had mm-hmm. changed her version of it remarkably. Mm-hmm. So I think songs are meant for that to happen to them. But you got to come at it. I, I feel like I have to come at it with this respect for the original place. So just when I feel like, oh, you're going a little too far, please return now, <laughs> to try to sing some line really in the original way so that it gets grounded. I mean, you and I both studied the standards, and uh, you have to do that with them. You have to keep coming back to the form of the song in some way and when somebody does it really well it's so beautiful to come from outer banks to there's the form there it is there it is there it is well this brings us to uh, getting toward the nitty-gritty of what i hope to uh, cross-examine you on (laughs) but um in an as an introduction to this process to to inquire about the real insight about that process I'd like to just take one second, if you don't mind, and take a look at one of your beautiful books. This one is called Vocal River. Um, Perhaps it's your only actual book. The others are recording. It is my only actual book. Oh, my God, yes. Let me just say this is the most beautiful, just physically beautiful books on the planet. I adore it. And it comes with these really neat um, cards that are exercise cards, mm-hmm. and they're they're kind of like uh, it's almost like playing a, a game or something. You pull up a card, and it gives you an exercise with a group exercise or process or something to try, and it describes ways that you can explore improvisation. Um, but the book is wonderful, and it's you know Ren and has contributed poetry into mm. the book, and and just simple, honest, really genuine, beautiful. Talk oh God, about, you're so kind. About her <laughs> life and about her music and about things. And I want to read you a couple of passages. Oh. On page eight. It's beautiful to walk alone to the microphone with my mind a clean slate and find music inside me that has been waiting for just this moment to be sung. Mm. I love that. And the mm. other that I'm a fan of is a passage and you know imagine here's Rhiannon and she's walking up to the microphone with no preconception of what she's going to do and here's the passage from the book to create a cross boundary and form requires the right combination of willing souls and the same intention and time and space to work out the kinks It is a valued and respected aspect of art, extending back into all of history and across cultures. This is collaboration as prayer. All of us lead and all of us follow. No one makes choices that would shake the foundation. We want our partners to shine. Generosity is the goal. Trusting these other humans crosses all boundaries. Mm. All that is left is a fragile, powerful, potent in- adventure. May it always be so. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's beautiful. Wow. Way to go. That's well written. Well, um, I was born in South Dakota on a farm and grew up singing classical music and then moved to New York and taught high school English and theater. Got my master's degree in theater. Lived in New York and went to cattle calls and went to jazz clubs every night moved to Chicago and was in a street theater, and then I moved to San Francisco in 1973. And what was going on there was the foundation for all of this, which was that everybody was improvising. It was the 70s. It was San Francisco. You're from there, you know. Mm -hmm. So on any night, you could go to a dance performance that was improvised or an orchestral performance that had elements of improvisation, or you could go to an art opening and there'd be somebody improvising. And I went, I hung out with dancers and actors and photographers and painters and writers, and that was very normal. I'm so blessed to have entered that environment where it was completely, uh, if you didn't improvise, you couldn't play. Hmm. And uh, so I, I, I think that that's created this whole hub of why I feel music as a communal art form and how, how 
it passed through that because I lived in that community where people were teaching each other. We were all teaching each other how to do this and how to do it better. And then still people were composing and they were creating form. But when you acted it out, a lot of times it was improvised. Mm -hmm. So what I wrote in there is a, is is the product of being in this culture at a time when that was the norm. Mm -hmm. And then meeting people like Bobby and meeting people like Alive. And, and through my whole career, there have been a lot of dancers mm -hmm. that I've collaborated with and taught with, a lot of body workers that I've taught with. So I, and California, God bless California for being this haven for people to try new things. You go as far west as you can, you get to California, and then if, unless you're going to jump in the ocean, you've reached the edge and you better figure out how to change how to grow. Mm -hmm. I think that's California's enormous gift to the world. You know, you're from here. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, just backtracking a little bit to when you were working with Atmara the other night and you did both sides now, you began to talk about form that you felt, well, I really need to cycle around now and reference the song again to, sh be, to honor the song. Can you talk uh, a little bit about, share with us what happens when you're not doing a song and it really is just free improvisation, whether it be with the spontaneous group, which is the Abe Laboreal and, you know, Odd Morrow and, and um, Alex, Alex Acuna, Acuna and, um, or whether it be with your vocal group, We Be Three, or by yourself. Mm -hmm. um, what is there? form in it? Do you, do, do you aspire to create some level of form? What is, what is the structure, if anything? Um, how does the listener, how is the listener able to follow your track and your train of thought? Why mm -hmm. does it not get born? Mm -hmm. Well, that goes back to San Francisco too, because I remember at some point, all that improvising, I began to think, Oh my God, if someone is not actually doing this or having to watch this enormously long thing that we're doing, how are they possibly following this? Why isn't this boring? And then I thought, oh, actually, it probably is. So there was this great free palette, but we didn't have, we didn't really have enough form. We were breaking form. So that's when I got, that's when I swung over to jazz because I thought, okay, here's a form that's got the head. You always sing the head. And then you go out, and you can go as far out as you want, but you know, you know the chord changes. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was like a great brilliance to find that music of freedom that also, it's solidly what it is. So I, and, and Bobby is very much about form as well. So my teachers in, in this form along the way have always, I think, thought about song form. So I do, when I, when I even when I'm, um, when I'm not even singing lyrics, I'm just singing lines, I'm, I'm repeating, I'm trying to examine a form the way a composer would. I just am doing it spontaneously. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to see how far I can go inside that form, and then I go to the bridge. Now, <laughs> I think about would, going to the bridge. Would the form show up in terms of moti motives that develop, sure. or rhythmic patterns? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So at the same time, I'm, I've been teaching all like 40 years, so I'm learning how to perform on stage because of the way I'm teaching. My students are constantly giving me new ideas. And so what I'm seeing is if I teach people to improvise by showing them the elements that hold music together, then when they're improvising, they're always going to be thinking, oh, we need a bass line. <laughs> or oh, there's no percussion, or wow, that could use two or three harmonies, which is what musicians always, we're always thinking that, but if you don't have the freedom to um, express that because you're inside of a certain song form, then you don't. But if you're improvising, then you're creating the form. So that's, that's why I wrote the book, because I thought I should put these things down, even though the idea of an improviser writing a book is really weird. <laughs> But then the more I taught, the more I thought, actually, I always feel like if I do this exercise first, it could lead to this or this or this. But if I don't do that initial exercise, there's a key piece of information that they don't get. So it just started to become really a pedagogy, I have to say. Um, and, and then I could see that students were able to sing with each other 
and, and understand what scale they were in. So for me, it should have tonal center. There should be some kind of scale, although the scale could change at the bridge or wherever. Mm -hmm. But th th there's a there's a scale. You you know where you are. I don't like the audience to feel on the outside of what's going on. I want them mm -hmm. to feel like they're, in fact, helping to create the pathway by their energy of listening and witnessing. And our job on stage is to receive that information and not fight it. So not only am I with Amaro, but we're with the whole audience. So whatever vibe I'm getting, which was a really good one the other night, then he and I just try to see where the music wants to go. That's the best way I know how to say it. Because actually it's in the air. The music's in the air. So what happens during the occasional time that the, the vibe is not good for whatever reason? You're not, you're distracted. Mm -hmm. The people you're working with are distracted. The audience, there's an odd vibe in the room or something like that. Yet, your task is to create something from nothing and mm -hmm. make it wonderful. Practice, practice, <laughs> practice, practice, <laughs> practice. What, what practice. do we practice? Because see, this is what I think people don't get and why it is not yet an essential part of music conservatory, music university training because it's not regarded as primary to the musical um, pantheon. <laughs> but it is. I think if you understand improvisation you and you practice it. So you practice learning how to sing bass lines. You practice being steady at percussion. You practice being in, able to invent patterns on the spot. Uh, here, here's an exercise that I do with myself that really taught me a lot about patterns. It's called home. Boat let let it did that um boat let it did that that um boat let it did that that um boat let it did that that um that da 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 boat let it did that that um be di 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 boat let it did that that um boat let it did that da 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 boat let it did that that um like that, and I do that for like three minutes. So I teach myself that home has got to be there. So you've got one little snippet yep. that is home base yep. and you always return to yep. it. And you don't go away very long because okay. if you go away like four bars, no way, no way back. Mm -hmm. You can't remember it. So mm -hmm. I think it's there is this sense that improvisers go way out there. But in fact, I, I think really successful, good improvisation has got so much home in it. And then when you go, people can tolerate it. They can they can fly with you, and you can feel how to, to get back. Because music's a language. It's not random. We're not doing random things out there. Mm -hmm. It's it's composed of a lot of things that people study together. So f I, I that's the deal, is make sure you know where home is. Mm -hmm. And you better be the same one. you got to keep your one. You don't get to wander around. So y your time has got to be really solid. And that comes from practice. So the answer to your question is practice. As an improviser, you just teach yourself what are the elements where you're weak. Maybe you're not very good at harmony because you're always the lead singer. So you get yourself to figure out some um, harmonic exercises, which could be any kind of thing. Mm -hmm. There are a whole bunch of them out there. Well, I know there's a lot actually in your, your uh, CD set, Flight, from quite a few years ago, but mm -hmm. I was just listening to it again the other day, and wow, it's nice. There's a lot mm -hmm. of wonderful ideas there, and it's mm -hmm. presented uh, in a very warm, inviting way. It works really well. I think if someone wanted to practice improvisation with, say, their workshop or their class, that would be a good vehicle for it. It's also good to just do alone. I was more thinking about creating something for individual singers because my students would say, I don't know how to practice. Mm -hmm. So I, it's all call and response. So I tried to give an idea in a certain piece of something we're going to practice, and then I leave room for you okay. and practice. So it's very much, the first CD is very much like a lesson. Mm -hmm. The second one has got five other great singers on it, so we created sound beds that somebody could use to practice things in odd meter, something in a more of a salsa groove, like that, uh, gospel, and still it's call and response. So we would sing something, we leave an obvious space for the person to fill it in. 
And then after a while, I thought, oh, I need to, I'm really working more with groups. So how can, I need to write a book that's about how you work together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where Vocal River comes in. That's where Vocal River comes in. Okay. Because I, I, and, and you know, there are groups, there are a lot of circles of improvisers around the country and in Europe where I've gone. I go back and they've found it like a, like fish to birds. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. There. That's Kat, Kathy Siegel Garcia's group. Well, mm-hmm. I'm sure it's they would consider it a community group, but I think Kathy might be the the, the person that's... She's a that's, really good initiator. Yeah, initiating. Yeah. She mm-hmm. calls it. Yeah. So, yeah, there are six of them, and they're doing totally improvised concerts, using a lot of these vocal river forms, because mm-hmm. they talked to me about wanting mm-hmm. to do it, and I did some coaching with them. And, of course, now they're evolving their own um, ideas of what works for them and how they like to move there so there are groups all over that's the idea that it becomes these um, independent groups what we're trying to do is grow improvisation mm-hmm. and uh, for everyone listening I just want to let you know that um, on uh, the nichemusic.com website there'll be a podcast page and there'll be show notes so that you mm-hmm. can find the name of uh, each of these materials and really any Thing we reference websites or whatever mm-hmm. will be listed there so you can go there and and take a look that's um, so kind of you okay. no, no, that's part of the but that's part of the community that's mm-hmm. that's what <clears throat> makes it all work is that generosity as it turns out that word generosity that's that's it that's mm-hmm. the biggest deal so if you're thinking on stage not about h- how good you look but I need to make sure my partners are safe and strong and look good, and look good. <laughs> then it just takes all this pressure off so if I'm doing a big exercise with a circle of people who are kind of scared and I can see on their forehead that they're planning what they're going to do and I, and I said for one thing no matter what you think you're going to do when you open your mouth it won't be that so that's not helping you the other thing is if you focus on the person who's singing you're sending them a lot of energy and love mm-hmm. that takes your mind off yourself and it gives power to the whole circle so for me it's really that's nice that is such a nice thought it's not even nice it's true it's just, <laughs> you know it, it sheds a different light I mean for some some of some people may have a conception about these vocal and pop you know um, circle singing groups that it's just a free-for-all and you know I, I don't know what people think, but sometimes I think it can be hard to relate to it first because the form and the structure and the, the, the nature of the concept is not immediately evident all the time, especially mm-hmm. in groups that are not very experienced. Oh, it can be right? really... So to think of it as terrible, you know, that the individuals are interested to be generous and to be giving not just to the listeners mm-hmm. that are listening, but to the rest of the group. Mm-hmm. I mean, that kind of sheds a whole different light on it. And to think about the concept of home, to establish home yeah. in, in a piece and then keep coming back yeah. to it. that. Thank you. That's very helpful, I think, for people to, to understand the art form. Good. Um, yeah, I, I'm i happy for that. It, yes. And um, now I want to talk about a, a four-letter word. <laughs> and it's, it's the word F-E-A-R, mm. fear. The reason I want to talk about it is it's so very prevalent in my experience in working with people in the idea of improvisation. Even though what I do is I teach jazz improvisation that is based in the bebop language, basically. Um, but I teach it all over the world, and with small groups and large groups, and cultures that speak English and cultures that don't, mm-hmm. and all kinds of American groups at different ages and different experience levels. And if there's one common denominator, F-E-A-R is the common denominator. Mm-hmm. Everybody's afraid. To look bad, of course. Nobody mm-hmm. wants to look bad. Yeah. Jeez. Uh, I think of music as a spiritual path. I have come to feel it that way. That takes some pressure off. Um, 
I have played with a lot of people who pray before they go on stage. And they pray really great. For example, Abraham Laboreal and Alex Acuna. We just, if, if I'm getting afraid or getting what we would call afraid, we just stand together and hold hands and then they, they talk about blessing this and blessing Rhiannon and blessing this place and uh, bless this day and how beautiful this day has been and here we are able to make this music together. They just talk in this very sincere way to, to lift us up. We, we would call our religious beliefs different, but the spiritual aspect of standing together and, and asking for the grace to make beautiful music, I, I'm completely there. And then I'm not afraid anymore because it's not about me. It's about uh, something bigger than me. My job is to get on board. That's all. My job is to get on board. So that's my fear when I'm teaching in a I always teach in a circle as do most of us I think so we're facing each other um, that I think that helps to remove some fear because you're actually looking at other people's bodies I try to do some things that relate to the body first thing I do a, a very often I do a breath meditation at the beginning of a session where I talk about dropping the breath through your body and I, and I go into some detail of, about the places where you find obstacles, the places where the breath kind of won't penetrate uh, because we all have places that hurt or people places that are holding memory or so we work with that and then I send it down through the bottoms of your feet down into the floor down through the structure of whatever city I'm in and into the earth because for me if if I understand that I'm standing in a particular place on a piece of earth and this is where the farm girl comes in if I know that and I know that the earth is under my feet that is so solid so um, I get a lot of music from the the air and the earth mm -hmm. if I'm around the water that's even better elemental so I try to take people in at the beginning of a session in which we understand where we are and that we're breathing and there's something about this circle that has a lot of power and that they're not alone. And then we do kind of scary things pretty much right off the bat. Uh, like we dance. Lots of times we dance. <laughs> Just because people sweat. Mm -hmm. They dance. They laugh. It should be something kind of... You know rhythmically powerful and then we do something like maybe cross the circle where each person just takes a turn crossing the circle singing and moving and by the time we do some of those things everybody's worst fears have already happened yeah <laughs> and and I and they they've got to believe that I'm watching for them you know that as a teacher. Yes, that it's, you're caring, you're on their side. It's our gig. You want them to be yep. their best. Yep. Absolutely. And they're not going to be mm -hmm. wrong. They're practicing. Yeah. It's, it's that thing that's just, that's what the students were saying this weekend in L.A., that there's a perfection about studying music that I really think we can shift. Mm -hmm. I don't see any reason why not. It just doesn't have to be that way that's that terrorizes people from not doing it the right way mm -hmm. of course you're studying deeply studying technique and um and form and composition and all those things but there's got to be another side that that helps to balance it i just think fear is um, it's manageable mm -hmm. it's it's manageable it's a human emotion i mean some people will mm -hmm. tell you it's the other side of excitement and it is, of course it is, but when fear has got a grip on you, that's pretty hard to call it excitement. It just feels like fear. So I, I try to call things to the best of my ability, how, how I see it, and and then whoever, however many people are in the circle, they're holding each other. That's mm -hmm. the job. It's not just the teacher's job. It's mm -hmm. everybody. Yes. And over the course of a day, they start to realize that it's actually true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I thank you for that, and I, I do that a bit too in my workshops. Just I'll, I'll just say a few sentences about how, you know, today, during this time that we're together, 
we are a family, you know. Nice. We're here to be together, to enjoy the process and to learn and to be vulnerable and, um, and so on. And that type of thing really does help set the stage. And I'm inspired by your idea of starting with movement getting physically involved. I, I think I'll steal that idea Sweaty. if I may. Yeah, just make uh, little playlists. <laughs> like sometimes I do something that's kind of slow and then people can do stretching yeah. and then kick it up. And mm -hmm. I, I love it. It's the first card. Oh. Dance. Okay. Good. Great. <laughs> so I got it from, uh, I, I don't know, I probably got it from my dancer friends. <laughs> Is there anything that you would like to share with uh, with singers, may they be young, may they be old, may they be experienced, may they not be experienced. Um, just in general, words of wisdom, tips, advice. Um, in oh, thing. that's so large. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, the thing that comes to my mind is um, integrating. Integrate who you are, what you know, what you do, the particularness of you and your situation, uh, the language that you speak. I think in integrating is, it's not so easy in modern times. We're very divided into uh, compressed appointments and digital devices. And, but essentially we're, we're so similar. And yet those particular parts are what make our creativity so beautiful. Yesterday there there were a lot of the international students and I was saying to them, when you're studying jazz, make sure that at some point you return to your your mother tongue. Find a way not to lose the place you come from and the soil that's there where you come from. In uh, Otherwise you'll just fall into this bottomless pit of uh, anonymous singers and what you want is to be yourself so yeah I would say that integrating and get outside uh, I've in my 60s now I'm 70 but uh, in the middle of my 60s my my wife and I moved to Hawaii and bought a farm and we're growing food and we're building or about to build a music studio I hope you'll come and you could do a class there it would be great <laughs> trying to integrate growing food having animals, being out in the open with creating. Mm. And I, I don't see why those wouldn't go together. It's as old as humans gathering around a fire. Mm -hmm. The things that we've done to it to make it specialized to our time are, are just that there. But the essential way back to the beginning is us gathering and, and creating. It's, it's our, it's, we're built, as, we're built mm -hmm. to be creative. Well, I'm so glad you, you started talking about that. First of all, I'm going to like book my flight soon <laughs> to Hawaii because that sounds wonderful. I'd love to be there and join you on the farm. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I was going to ask you what makes you happy outside of music. And I think you just spoke to that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, swimming too. Swimming, oh. swimming. I love In to the swim. Ocean, right? uh, anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I was talking to Kate Richard Geller, yeah. who lives here, mm -hmm. she's got a scientific mind and studied um, a lot of music therapy. So she's saying the studies now are showing that immersion in water of your choice mm. um, lights up the whole brain, as does singing. Mm. There's something about singing that integrates and and just puts lights everything up. So yeah. So I love to swim, the, getting immersed in, in, in water. The water of Hawaii is especially uh, beautiful that way. But lakes, oh yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then the farm, having animals on the farm. Here's what I get to do when I'm home. I, go, I wake up at dawn, I go out, and I learn this chant to the sun in Hawaiian. Because also there's music that belongs to place. You can hear it, like if you're in the Balkans and people start singing, that way, mm -hmm. you feel like, wow, there's something of the whole history mm -hmm. of this place that's in that tone. Uh, Hawaiian music is all vowels. It's just like there are only 12 letters in their alphabet, and most of them are vowels. So they're, the singing is so, oh, belongs to there. So I, I learned this chant. So I sing to the sun, 
and then I go let the ducks and chickens out. And then I say my prayers for all the people that I love who I'm not with, and then I'm good. I'm ready. Uh, and, and I feel like that's a, that's a, that's a way that, that music wants to be in our lives daily for really functional as well as artistic reasons. Like if you, if you hang around anybody who's, um, whose culture goes back and back and back, they've got songs for everything, for all the cooking work, for all the labor to, to bring the, the animals and the food and build. And th that's what it's always been, to, to deal with fear. Mm -hmm. uh, I've often referenced in, in clinics how uh, the you know indigenous musics, whether it be you know from Brazil, or samba, or, or mm -hmm. whatever, or swing music in the United States, um, are so connected with the language. Mm -hmm. You know the, yep. the the rhythms within the language, and the, the flavor. Sometimes even the mood. You know, I'm thinking Brazil especially is very connected. Oh yeah, you know, and how it comes out in the music. Gorgeous. Yeah. It's meant to be that way, so that's what I mean. It's in the soil. Mm -hmm. It's actually in the land, what goes on there. So, uh, and then I get to make this transition, which I must admit is sometimes a little awkward, from being a farmer. I get on a plane, and I land somewhere on the mainland or Europe, and I become a musician, teacher. Mm -hmm. It's just, if I could iron out those transitions, uh, it would be, because I'm so lucky to get to live on a farm and then go to places of lots of people and sing and teach. And then get to go back. And go back to the farm. Because the farm is fueling me, but the music on the road is also fueling me. Mm -hmm. I, I really, I get that humans have a kind of diverse notion of what makes us happy. Like, what makes you happy? You know, what makes me so happy is to be outside and to be out hiking um, and, and or exploring in, um, I, we bought an old uh, 2001 um, Jeep. It's a piece of junk. It's a pile of garbage, but it's really high clearance Great. with giant wheels. And we can go driving in the southwest deserts and go places that other people can't go. And to plop down my tent there, I have no happier place in the world than my tent. <laughs> I love it. And I figured out how to be very comfortable in it and to uh -huh. make that situation really comfortable. And, and, and how does that change your music? Well, uh, gosh, I that's... I don't I don't know exactly. I think it it just puts me at a place where I've got a place to go to that's not my office and it's not a teaching room and it's not you know, dare I say it's not being around large groups of people. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. being it's getting some solitude and some peace and mm -hmm. and, and it's it's getting away from sound. Mm -hmm. I actually love a crave to, to have peace and quiet. Mm -hmm. I'm sure many of us do because yeah. we don't get that that much in life but there is a kind of sound out there in the desert like mm. almost yes. beyond what the ears can hear mm -hmm. but the aliveness of the stone mm -hmm. oh my goodness mm -hmm. i really admire that you do that that's well, very come, great uh come join me well today. really my wife is a photographer and she yes. loves nothing more than Stone. Wow, I would love that. And I can, well, let's. Okay, deal. Really, I mean, we want to get one of those little campers, those tiny ones that mm -hmm. kind of fold all up. Yeah. That we can have as a yeah. base mm -hmm. and then be able to go out from there. Mm -hmm. I, I just think it, the, the fuel is so real, but it's not, you can hardly put it into words, and I don't know that either of mm -hmm. us want to. It's just. Well, it's the, to me, it's the epitome of presence and mindfulness mm -hmm. to be sitting in the desert, just being there and, and enjoying the solitude and the quiet. It brings you to the present moment, which is the most nice, nicest place to be all the time, as does improvisation. Yeah, there you exactly go. Exactly the same principle. We're just trying to get awake. We're trying to be more awake, more awake, more awake. Mm -hmm. And a reminder that the desert never sleeps. Yeah. Really? Uh, the, like the farm, there's a sound that goes on in like the l early evening, early morning, before th the, the sounds you can hear with your ears kick in. There's a hum that has increased because the land is now <laughs> happier than mm -hmm. it was. 
because we're growing all these things and it's it's refreshed and fertilized and so there is a like a vibration going on there almost subliminal yeah. just uh, feeling and, yeah. and I'm sure that the subtlety of the sounds the the beetle bugs are zooming the tulip trees yes are blooming, right? exactly um, yeah you you sense the environment it's not another acuteness. human in view <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, it's so nice to have you here, Ryan. Really? What a pleasure. We've waited a whole lifetime to have this conversation. Yes. Yeah. I hope that there's a future for us to um, just do some things together in the desert or, you know, in Hawaii or just I love that. continue the continue the conversation. Yeah. Really I wish you all the best in the beautiful things you're bringing to the planet with your music. Thank you. Your teaching. It means so much. You're a... You're really um, a, a great leader in this in this effort to to uh, signify. Thank you, thank you so much. And um, just to our listeners, uh, well, first of all, where can people find you and know more about your mm -hmm. stuff? Uh, my website is riannonmusic.com. Okay, R H I A N N O N. Okay, it's the Welsh version. Good. And again, if um, for the listeners, you can also go, well, I'm sure Rhiannon has all of her materials noted on the website, mm -hmm. you know, and you can, any other things we referenced, you can go to mishmusic.com and uh, look and you'll find, you'll find it, everything there also. Well, thank you so much. And uh, I know you have another um, event you're too i hope you just i wish you had more time here yes, well i love to come to la it's it's um it's a beautiful spot with a lot of singers yeah. thank yes. you thank you great to have you here thanks for joining us for today's podcast and please don't forget to subscribe visit www.mishmusic.com slash podcast for more info about today's guest and links to products and people that were discussed See you next time.